second fret. Yeah. All right. Which one is the first one? Good morning. So I've just been made aware that our sanctuary clock is about 15 minutes slow. But uh, you're all here, and that's good. If you could take a moment and try to let all that stuff that's on your mind go, the fact that we're starting late, the fact that you probably have a, a gathering this evening, the fact that no one cares which teams are playing. If you can just let all that go for a moment. If you could stand with me and worship the God of creation. First song we're singing is Open the Eyes of My Heart. I think that's the name of the song. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, cause I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy. I am lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. See you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 I want to see you. The next song is, what is it? Cornerstone. Christ Alone Cornerstone. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Jesus. 
Jesus' blood and righteousness, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, the holy trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. alone cornerstone we may strong in the Savior's love through the storm He is Lord Lord of all when the darkness seems to This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence. Living in me, this is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken. And I I'm desperate for you And I I'm lost without you This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This 
is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me, and I. For you, and I, I'm lost without you. And I, I'm desperate for you. without you Father God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for all the people that are gathered today. Lord, I pray that you would bless our time together. I pray that you would increase and that we would decrease, Lord. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. And before you sit down, make sure you make some good eye contact. If you feel up to it, you can make a little handshake, a little hug. If you don't feel up to it, just give the wave. Hello. Good morning. Off a quick uh, observation, I can tell we're all wearing the jerseys of the team we care about most. I've never had a Super Bowl affect me less. Anybody else in my boat? All I know is I need to find a new team to make fun of because I've always made fun of Cincinnati my whole life because they don't have fans, at least not that I was ever aware of. Apparently, they're going to have a bunch next year. We still have those residual Cowboy fans around from like 1993, so I have a feeling that we'll have a bunch of Bengals fans in elementary school. If you didn't follow me there, that just means you have better things to think about. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus, or excuse me, <laughs> let me start that again. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Good morning. Ah. So I ran into something that many of you probably do. I read multiple versions of the Bible. So if I'm doing a Bible study, I'll be using a different version. If I'm preparing my sermon, I'm probably doing it at NIV. And then when I come up here, it's in New King James. So... When I start quoting a verse, sometimes what you get is this mishmash of all these different versions of the Bible kind of swirled together. And I, I kind of, I, I wasn't reading. I know this verse partially in four different versions. <laughs> all together, it makes up what I started with. So I'll try, try to, to say, stay to the text. Um, we are to salvation last week we discussed sin 
And again, I'm following the uh, Confession of Faith in a Mennonite perspective as an overview, just as a starting point. Um, I believe we are on Article 8 out of 24, which means that we are well into this now. And again, the whole goal here is not to try to convert every visitor we have into being a Mennonite, but these are the things that we say that we adhere to. When you join this church, we, we say we adhere to these, and I honestly believe that it is pretty fundamental Christianity. Fundamental can be a scary word, but that's not how I meant it. <laughs> I'm going to start in Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17. This is the part where any of my students would be like, oh, because I currently have them memorizing this section of Scripture. They're up to verse 13, so they're doing Exodus 20, 1 through 13. They're reciting this every week for a grade. I have a really fun life. I'm not sure if I had mentioned that. We worked up to it, though. For the first week, it was verses 1 through 3, and then the next week, it was verses 1 through 6, and then verses 1 through 9, and verses 1 through 12. We just got through that. And now that we have so many verses, we're only going from 1 to 13 next week. So um, I'm not as vile as maybe you heard when I first brought that up. But they are learning this. Um, to be able to recite it, because I learned once that I believe 20% of evangelical Christians, of Bible-believing Christians, people that claim to believe in Scripture, that only 20% of them can name five of the Ten Commandments. That's bad. But since I am in a, I have a platform where I can change that, um, that's kind of what I'm doing to combat that statistic is every year I make my kids memorize this entire section of Scripture. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 17. And you're like, what does this have to do with salvation? Well, everything. But we'll come back to that. I am the Lord your God. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> I jump to verse 2. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image in the likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children, to the third and the fourth generation, of those who hate me, but showing steadfast mercy to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor the, your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. That was 1 through 12, so that's what my children are reciting. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, nor shall you covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. So what we have here is a summation of the law that God gave to Moses. This is the Big Ten. And you'll notice that the first several commandments deal with our relationship with God. And then the rest of them deal with how we treat each other. And to echo how Jesus said it when someone said, what is the most important commandment in the law? He said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Which honestly looks like the first 11 verses. And then to love your neighbor as yourself, 
which looks like the rest of them, the rest of the verses, sorry. It can all be summed up in that. And I brought up more than once, and I will continue to bring it up, that in order to be saved from something, there must be something from which you need to be saved. What has Jesus come to save us from? There's a lot of answers to that, but they all point back to the exact same thing. Jesus came to save us from hell. Ultimately, yes, Jesus came to save us from sins. That's where I was going. Or you may say Jesus came to save us from ourselves. I think all of that is true. The wages of sin is death, eternal death. We call it hell, don't we? So Jesus did come to save us from sin, and he came to save us from hell, and he came to save us from ourselves because we are incapable of doing good aside from God. So now that we see what the problem is, the fact that I am incapable of keeping these laws, and I can just go down through them. Um, You shall have no other gods before me. How many times did I pray today? If I weighed that against how many times I thought a mean thought about somebody, use that same capacity that I could use to pray. I've used it to bring someone down or to say something nasty, which I haven't done much of yet today because I haven't interacted outside of Sunday school much. Give me till about 5 o'clock tonight. I'm still a human being, right? I probably won't verbalize it because God has done an amazing work in me, but my brain is still under construction. So I might already be disqualified on the first real commandment we wrote here. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, the earth beneath, or the waters below. You shall not bow down and worship it. Maybe not. I know a lot of people, though, that really do prioritize their things over their religion. Don't we all know someone or are that person that prioritizes our things, our financials, our financial security, the things that we think are necessity? Yes, my $19 phone. I think that's a necessity. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. How many things do we, we place in that position, though, where we, we almost make idols out of them? If you spent eight hours today on Facebook and read half of your daily devotion, I would say your, your priorities are out of whack now, right? That's easy to throw stones at because we all fall down that rabbit hole. You get on Facebook to tell the people whose birthday it is, happy birthday, and then you see a meme that makes you laugh, then then you spend the next 30 minutes scrolling down, then you watch a Ben Shapiro video, and then you're off in la-la land, because then it starts recommending videos. I'm the only one. I know. Okay, so I do that. You probably don't. And maybe it's not Facebook. Maybe you sat down to watch the news, and then you're like six episodes into gun smoke, and you really meant to go do something. Festus makes me laugh. I mean, not everybody's into gun smoke. But these things can all become idols to us. How many people are tuning into the Super Bowl tonight? How many people skip church today to prepare their Super Bowl party for tonight? Or, you know, that block of commercials interrupted by a football game. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That is a rough one. How many Christian people you know that will casually drop the name of the Lord? Say, oh my Lord. Say, oh my God. Say things like that, just flippantly. You know, Jewish people don't do that. (laughs) That's why we have words like Adonai and Hashem, because they don't want to misuse the name of the word their God. They've even come up with pronouns so that they don't accidentally break that commandment. I'm not saying you have to do that. Again, not trying to convert you to Judaism. I'm just saying there is something about this commandment that we don't seem to understand. 
When was the last time you heard a politician lying, using a Bible verse, trying to get you to vote over something or change your political outlook based on a Bible verse? Is that not taking the name of the Lord your God in vain? Someone who pretends to be a fined up standing member of a church to secure more votes, isn't that taking the name of the Lord your God in vain? Doesn't it seem like it? Or stamping a particular denomination on an organization just because you know you'll use it? There's a lot of, quote, Christian colleges that aren't Christian anymore. But they know you're still going to send your kid there because when you went there, it was a Christian college. And it still says Christian in the title. Not to attack higher learning. I think learning is great. I also think that there's a lot of bizarre ideas behind why people become educated. If you want to become a laboratory scientist, go to college. If you want to become a teacher, go to college. Right? If you want to open up a restaurant someday, take that tuition money and open a restaurant. It's going to be the best teacher you ever had. That's an opinion, though. That isn't in the Word of God at all. I'm just saying. <laughs> I was chasing a bunny there. Um, that's not in the Word of God anywhere. Um, sorry. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What does that mean? There's an old argument, and I know Mennonites had this argument and still do. What does it mean to keep the Sabbath? Does that mean you use the Sabbath setting on your stove? Everybody pulls out cold cuts for lunch. No one does dishes. Kids don't make any noise. Is that what keeping the Sabbath means? Does keeping the Sabbath mean taking time to rest in the Lord throughout the week? What day is the proper day for the Sabbath? Because they're Seventh-day Adventists? I've just found out they're a Seventh-day Baptist. I'd never heard of them until yesterday. Where they're Baptists, but the Sabbath has to be on Saturday. Because Sabbath means Saturday. It's logical. Is it much ado about nothing? Maybe. What does it mean to keep the Sabbath? Because I know we're commanded to keep the Sabbath. So what does it mean to keep the Sabbath? If we look at the words of Jesus, we'll probably pull a different trans, you know, meaning from what it means to keep the Sabbath than if we are just to read this isolated and not through a Christian lens. Am I muddying the water? It's good for you. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Honor your father and your mother. When do we outgrow, outgrow honor your father and your mother? Does that mean to live under the thumb of your father for the rest of your life? Does it mean, what does it mean to honor your father and your mother? You know, you can sue your parents. Is that honoring our parents? You can't tell me what to do. You shall not murder. Jesus tells us if we're angry in our hearts, we have already committed murder. That just got more complicated. Don't murder. That's just physically, that's a pretty easy commandment to, to, to take. Don't kill anybody today. Got it. You shall not commit adultery. We're also told if you've looked lustfully upon another person, you've committed adultery in your heart. I'm not going to ask for hands on that one. But show of hands. You shall not steal. Here's the fun one. How many things have you done that don't show up on your taxes? Just a question. Is that right that the government takes that money? Doesn't matter. Do they take that money? Yeah, they kind of do. Just a thought. How many of you borrow things from church and don't bring them back? 
Not just this church, but any church. Oh, I meant to pick some up. I'll bring that right back. No, you won't. Once it leaves the doors, it forgets where it lived. I'm sure just about any cleaning product that has ever been bought for any church, unless locked back up by the cleaning staff, has somehow migrated to someone's home that intended to replace it or pick up another one later. It's a small thing. It really is. I'm not saying that to come down on people for taking the pine saw home. I don't care. I, I mean, deep down, I really don't care. But it's easy to judge someone for stealing a candy bar and overlook the fact that we may have accidentally stolen a thing or two over the years. Or when you look down at the bottom of your cart leaving Walmart and you notice that whatever you had to put on the bottom rack that they didn't ring up and you forgot about it. And now you're at your car and you realize you've just spent or you just stole $13.83 worth of bird seed. Do you walk back in and pay for it? Or you just think back to that time they rang you up for all the stuff you didn't get. <laughs> or you just be like, oh, it's all junk made in China anyway. Is it? I'm just saying, it's easy to judge people over the Ten Commandments, but how are we actually doing with them as me, as me as an individual, as you as an individual? How are we really doing with the sins that Scripture exposes in our lives? You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Don't lie. We start lying when we start talking. Sometimes people expect you to lie. Don't ask those questions would be a great place to start. Um, but there's a, probably a bunch of different ways. The fish was this big. I think if anybody was telling you their golf score and they didn't lie, you'd be unimpressed. I can't get it off the tee, so I'm not a golfer. I don't know. And then the really hard one, because even if you're doing great with the other nine, thou shalt not covet. Don't want what everybody else has. Don't want to do what everybody else is doing. Don't covet. Don't want to. Oops. So this is our sins exposed, right? This is just a quick litmus test to say, hey, we're sinners. That's not why God gave it to us. God gave these to us to be the things that we're supposed to be shooting for, right? These are the, this is the goal. I'm not going to put any gods before God. I'm going to live right before God and before other people, right? This is the commandment. This is what I'm trying to do with all of my being. But then we discover that, no, I can't do it, which is why Jesus puts Jesus, which is why God the Father... And because, anyway, um, this is why we have a sacrificial system before this, because people were going to sin, and people were going to sin unintentionally. And because the wages of sin is always death, something has to So people had to do sacrifices to make up for the fact that they couldn't keep these laws. And then we have Jesus, perfect sacrifice that pays over. sins, when we put our faith in the sacrifice, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ to take our sins, to, to be the penalty for our sins. I'm going to jump ahead to John 3. This is, I think, my second time ever preaching out of John 3, and I'm hoping it goes a little gentler afterward than the first time. First time I preached out of John 3, a beloved Christian brother pulled me aside and told me I missed the point. You missed the point. So hopefully I find the point today. I would be of the mind, though, that there is more than one point in John 3. But I didn't say the one he wanted. 
I'm also going to say something really nerdy at the end of verse 1. You may have heard me talk about it before, but just prepare your brains. I'm going to say something very nerdy. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. I can't help but do this, but Nicodemus reminds me of Wedge from the Star Wars trilogy. If that means nothing to you, God bless you. The first three Star Wars movies had all the characters people made t-shirts and toys and stuff about, but there was one character that was in all three movies that didn't die. Didn't get action figures of him made or anything. It was a guy named Wedge. He shows up, says like two lines, and he's gone in all the movies. And when I read about Nicodemus, that's who I think about because he's really important to the story, but people forget he exists. Hopefully that didn't cost you anything. He moves the story along. He tells us, like, real conversations happen around Nicodemus. But if you didn't know who Dick Nicodemus was, it wouldn't change the gospel at all. <laughs> anyway, that was my nerdy moment for, the, for right now. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed." But he who does truth comes to the light that his deeds may be done clearly and seen that they have been done in God. Going back to first, verse 14, Jesus brings up the Son of Man being lifted up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert. And I know I talked about this back when we were doing the story series is when people got bit by these snakes, God told Moses to make this bronze servant, put it on a staff, and lift it up. And those who kept their eyes on it lived. If you turned your eyes towards this and you kept your eyes on it, you would live. Those who chose not to, well, that's stupid. I'm not doing that. How can you know it's even going to work? How can you put your faith into something so strange? Those people died. And Christ is comparing himself to the bronze serpent. We're all poisoned. We all have this poison in our system, this venom, if you will, in our system. And we're all going to die. 
The wages of sin is death. We cannot not sin. We are sinful creatures. We are born into sin. Although, every time you do sin, you have a choice. I sin far less than I used to. And hopefully next year when I'm talking, I'll say I sin far less than I used to. And that that continues. But since we have this venom in us, if we turn our eyes towards Christ, who is comparing himself to that that bronze serpent that was lifted up in the desert, if we turn our eyes to him and we keep our eyes on Jesus, we will not die. That's a very clear analogy. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, we will not die. Those who do not look towards Jesus will die. Those who turn away from Jesus will die. John 3.15, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then the most quoted verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. What does that mean? Well, if you keep your eyes on Jesus, if you look towards Jesus, if you turn towards Jesus, and keep your focus on Jesus, you will not die. You will have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus didn't come to rub the Ten Commandments in our face because we weren't keeping them. We know we're inept. If this isn't very uplifting, I'm sorry. Um, We know we're inept. We cannot be righteous on our own. This is the part that should make you feel good. For God so loved the world. Guess who the world is? All of us. God so loved us. Why does God love us? That's none of my business. I don't know. For God so loved us that he sent his only begotten son to pay a price that I cannot pay because I cannot keep 10 commandments or 613 commandments or two commandments. Adam and Eve couldn't keep one. One simple commandment. I'm not God. That's it. We are inept. And for whatever reason, Jesus paid it all so that we can be right before God, that our sins were paid for once and for all. There is forgiveness for my sins. It doesn't mean that I continue on in sin because Jesus forgave me. I don't believe God is surprised, ever. You can disagree with me. But I find that to be very consistent with Scripture. I don't believe I can surprise God, who knit me in my mother's womb, who knew who I would become and would know my personality. If someone's disobedient in exactly the way you know them to be, are you disappointed in them? Are you surprised? If Christ called me to him knowing what a train wreck I was, I'm going to put that in the past tense, knowing what a train wreck I was, was he surprised by any of it? Or did he love me anyway? Is there ever going to be a sin that I accidentally or willfully commit that Christ wasn't aware of when he paid the the price for my sins? He's not surprised by my ineptitude. He just loves us anyway. God judges our hearts. If we're willfully and flippantly going around sinning, I would say that isn't a good sign for your spiritual life. If you don't care that you're sinning, you have heavier things to pray about. Your heart should break for what breaks the heart of the Father. We may too light a deal about sins, about our own sins. Let's just own this personally. 
If I'm in accountability with someone else as we're supposed to be with one another, once I remove that giant plank out of my eye, I can tell you about your spec. But what it, what it really comes down to is standing before God and saying, what are we working on today? What needs fixed in my heart today? How am I falling short today? You know, when you first get married, and I'm going to liken coming to Jesus to getting married because I think it's the closest human relationship you get to have. That and that of being a parent. Those are the two. When you first get married, the things that you argue about are actually bigger most of the time. You argue about things like finances because you... You shouldn't be hanging out with your friends so much or coming home before 3 o'clock in the morning. Things like that. Those are the things you argue about. Once you've been married 15 years, you argue about pick up your socks. Honey, those are your socks. Your, the level that you're arguing, the, the severity usually goes down a bit unless there's a real crisis going on. And I feel like it works that way with sin. Not that we can't commit horrible sins later, but the longer that you're in this relationship, the more precision the things you have to fix are. If you want to have a healthy relationship, you should always be working on yourself. You should be working on your relationship with the other. You should be trying to figure out what pleases the heart of the person you're with or pleases the heart of the Father, and you should be trying to refine yourself to be more what they need. I realized that all of that was out of fashion because I think almost anyone accepts the answer for why a couple breaks up is, oh, we just grew apart. Interesting. That's weird logic. Why did you allow yourselves to grow apart? You stopped prioritizing the two of you and you prioritized yourself each and every time. That's how it happens. And I'm not going to kick you if you've been divorced. I don't want to kick you when you're down. It's none of my business. It's none of my business. Unless you make it my business, and then we can talk about it. If you want my advice, I'll give you advice. But that really isn't it. We're not under the previous sins that have happened in our lives. Sometimes you aren't even a willing participant to that. I don't want to kick anyone while they're down. Relationships are difficult. But I know that as I go along in my marriage, as a father, as a Christian, I'm trying to look out for the well-being, for what delights the other. It's a little more complicated with my daughter because I feel in that analogy, I'm, I'm the father, right? <laughs> and I'm learning things about myself from watching my child. But with my wife, I'm seeing that if I give myself up, as Christ gave himself up for the church, that means dying. That means, am I willing to lay down my life daily for the benefit of my family? Most of the time. Just to be completely honest, most of the time. If you ask me, I'll always say yes, because I want that to be the truth. But what if there's something you really want to do? What if you get to go fishing, like for the first time in forever? You get to go fishing, but there's something you should be doing? Well, these are a lot of what-ifs. And hopefully I didn't make anyone feel worse. Wasn't my goal. What I want to do is make much about Jesus. I can make much about our sins. We know our sins. I've just talked about them for a long time. But I can make much about Jesus because Jesus thought you were worth it. That's weird as a human being to think about. Jesus thought you were worth it. To quote Greg Boyd, which I'm just going to do it, um, you will never look into the eyes of a human being that Jesus wasn't willing to die for. 
That's a very sobering realization. It doesn't matter what that person did or who that person is, you will never look into the eyes of someone that Jesus Christ wasn't willing to die for. But I don't want to say good morning to them. I'm afraid it might rub off whatever they've got going on. And if I feel that way, shame on me because it shouldn't be that way. I'm going to Hebrews. I'm just going to read a couple of verses from the beginning of Hebrews 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and the upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now this is important to what I was saying because of verse 3 more than anything. Being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person speaking about the Father, that Christ is the brightness of his glory and the image of his person and the upholding all things by the word of his power, When he, by himself, purged our sins. Purging. When he purged our sins, he flushed them out. He purged our sins. Sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So if someone says, where's Jesus? I'd be like, he's right here. He's at the right hand of the Father also. He's on his throne and I'm not. Do I trust in God enough to believe that I am forgiven? That's a different way to ask it that it gets a little scarier. Do you believe that you're forgiven? Because the Bible tells me you are if you have turned to Christ. I didn't ask if you're perfect. Do you believe you're forgiven? Do you believe that Jesus loves you? Is the hardest question I've ever had to answer. Actually, you. Do you believe that Jesus loves you? It's the weightiest theological question you've ever been asked, and you knew the answer in Sunday school. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That is the most perfect theological statement that I've heard that didn't come out of the Bible. And I struggle with it every day. But if I believe that God is God, and if I believe the words of God, then I must believe that Jesus forgave me and that I am beloved. And that is hard to deal with. It's hard to be loved when you didn't earn it. It's hard to have someone's affection when you know you don't deserve it. And as my wife likes to tell me, you need to get over yourself. Because Jesus loves you whether you like it or not. And he was willing to pay for your sins whether you accept it or not. So turn your eyes on Jesus. This is the part where many pastors I know have a prepared prayer that they'd like to lead you in, but I would like to make it much simpler than that. Turn your eyes on Jesus. Request forgiveness for your sins and walk towards Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Not because you're going to be perfect and not because your problems are going to go away, but because he loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. There's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Jesus loves you, so there.
And that's all I have for you today. Would you please, if you can do so without pain, will you stand with me?